On today's episode, China reveals a bold new plan to explore the solar system, while NASA finds something interesting on the planet Mars. ESA updates their own plans to land on Mars, while Europe's first rocket has an unexpected return to launch site. China has a new plan, and it involves the majority of our solar system, from Venus all the way out to Neptune. Most of this sounds fairly practical, but some of this stuff is downright insane. The Chinese recently created a new entity called the Deep Space Exploration Laboratory, the purpose of which was to strengthen the country's approach to exploration of the solar system. The laboratory is a partnership between China's National Space Agency and the University of Science and Technology of China. We know that China has been very active with its exploration of the moon, including the first rover and sample return from the lunar far side. And the Chinese were also the second nation after the USA to operate a rover on Mars. So they're coming to the table with some pretty solid credentials. Here's the scoop. 2028, the Tianwen-3 mission to Mars will collect samples of Martian soil and rocks for immediate return to Earth. This is one that we already knew about, but it's always good to see that the plan is still on track, which, if successful, will be the first ever Mars sample return mission, unless Elon can swoop in with a starship. 2029, Tianwen-4. This mission is to explore Jupiter and its moon Callisto. This is also one that we've heard about previously. It's an interesting mission profile because Tianwen-4 will join NASA's Clipper mission, which is studying the Jovian moon Europa, and the European JUICE probe that will primarily investigate Ganymede. So that gives us up-close studies for three of the four large Jovian moons, leaving Io as the odd one out. 2030, this will happen on Earth. China calls for the development of a large, ground-based habitat to simulate long-duration human spaceflight. I think we can essentially call this a Mars and Moon Base simulator. 2033, a mission to Venus that will return samples of the atmosphere to Earth. This one is pretty crazy. I guess it depends on how deep into the atmosphere they're planning to go. You could dip down with something like a glide vehicle or float in on a balloon, inhale a bunch of gas, and then fire up a propulsion system to return to orbit. This is the first I've heard of a legitimate Venus sample return. 2038, establishment of an autonomous Mars research station to study in situ resource utilization. Pretty much a robot Mars base. In theory, probably very similar to what China is going to do with their International Lunar Research Station, with a similar goal to lay the foundations for long-term human exploration. 2039, a mission to Neptune's largest moon of Triton. This would include a subsurface explorer for the moon's ocean. Just like Europa, it's believed that Triton has an icy shell with a saltwater ocean underneath. But we're not sure how thick that shell is, so any assumption that we could either drill or melt our way through it and drop a submarine down there would be ambitious at best, especially considering the mass limitations when sending something that deep into outer space, unless we can unlock a much more efficient propulsion system by 2039, potentially something nuclear powered, and that's not too far of a stretch. So this is definitely a roadmap that we'll be watching with great interest over the years to come. And timing-wise, it comes during a period of great uncertainty at NASA. They're staring down some potentially devastating budget cuts. They still have no confirmed leader. Artemis is not looking so good, and their own Mars sample return is currently being pieced back together with international and private sector support. One thing we can say for sure is that right now, NASA is still doing some pretty amazing exploration work on the planet Mars. And what they've just discovered with the Curiosity rover has some potential to really blow people's minds. If you're not keeping track, Curiosity is the older of the two current Mars explorers. It was launched in 2011, and it's a nuclear-powered, six-wheeled robot about as big as a mid-sized passenger car. Curiosity has found something weird inside a Martian rock, the largest organic molecules ever detected on the red planet. What does that mean though? Organic molecule does not necessarily mean aliens confirmed. It's just a molecule that contains carbon, which is the basis of life as we know it. And by large, they mean a long chain carbon molecule, which means that it contains a large number of atoms all linked together. This is microscopic stuff. 
On Earth, relatively complex long-chain carbon molecules are associated with biology. These molecules on Mars could actually be fragments of fatty acids, which are often found in the membranes surrounding biological cells. If we're going to find evidence of life on Mars, it's going to be microbial in nature, because it's highly unlikely that a life-sustaining environment existed on Mars for a long enough time that would allow more advanced life forms to evolve. But because microbes are so small, they're also very difficult to positively identify. This type of evidence needs much more powerful scientific instruments that are too large to be carried on an interplanetary rover, hence the need for sample return missions. The organic molecules found by Curiosity seem to be made up of carbon atoms linked in long chains, with other elements bonded to them like hydrogen and oxygen. They come from a 3.7 billion year old rock named Cumberland, which was encountered by the rover in a dried up lake bed inside the Gale Crater. What scientists are actually looking to confirm on Mars would be evidence of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, the key components of life as we know it. But long chain hydrocarbon atoms are still a very exciting discovery. Among the molecules found were decane, which has 10 carbon atoms and 22 hydrogen atoms. There's also dodecane, which is 12 carbon atoms and 26 hydrogen atoms. These are known as alkalines, which fall under the umbrella of chemical compounds known as hydrocarbons. And it's discoveries like this that are fueling Mars' exploration into the future, like the Chinese missions that we talked about earlier, but there's also a big plan in the works at ESA, the European Space Agency. ExoMars represents Europe's third attempt to land successfully on the Red Planet. In 2016, ESA's Schiaparelli Mars lander crashed into the surface due to a computer glitch. In 2003, the European Beagle 2 lander successfully reached the surface of Mars, but its solar panels failed to deploy and it was never able to make contact with Earth. So there's a lot of pressure on ExoMars to succeed where others have failed. There's also a lot of money riding on this mission. 1.3 billion dollars in cost, which is not surprising when we consider that this mission has been in the works for two decades now. ExoMars was originally supposed to launch on a Russian Soyuz rocket in 2011. In the time since then, the mission profile has gone through multiple revisions and reinventions, with various international partners coming and going. At one point, this would have been a significant collaboration between Europe and Russia, but that's obviously no longer the case. In spite of all that, there is good news. It's recently been announced that the French aircraft maker Airbus will be replacing the Russians as the builders of the ExoMars landing platform. The landing platform is part of the ExoMars spacecraft that handles the final phases of its descent to the Martian surface. And then, after landing, the platform will deploy ramps to allow the ExoMars rover, named Rosalind Franklin, to roll onto the Martian surface. At the moment, ESA is still relying on NASA to get them to Mars. After the fallout with Russia, the mission could no longer rely on a proton launch vehicle. So NASA has agreed to contribute a rocket, an engine for the descent module with adjustable thrust, and radioactive heating units. It's still not decided what rocket that will be, but ExoMars is big enough that it will require something like a Falcon Heavy, a ULA Vulcan, or a Blue Origin New Glenn to send it on its way. That mission is tentatively scheduled to launch in December 2028. Again, unless Elon can swoop in with his fleet of starships. And speaking of rockets that blow up, a European aerospace company known as ISAR has finally launched their debut rocket, known as Spectrum, this past week. Although it never ended up in space and instead made an unexpected return to the launch pad. ISAR is a small space startup that has been developing a small satellite launcher since the mid-2010s. Known as Spectrum, the rocket would be able to better serve Europe's small sat industry by launching from their own continent at the Indoya spaceport in Norway. This flight has been in the works for years, and finally, early last month, ISAR received approval to launch their first rocket. This marked the first orbital launch attempt from mainland Europe outside of Russia, and it also marked the first use of Andoya as a spaceport. About 30 seconds into its flight, the rocket entered into a planned pitch-over maneuver in order to begin gaining horizontal velocity. 
This went terribly wrong, however, and the rocket quickly ended up with its nose pointing back towards the Norwegian island. We could see the rocket was trying to compensate for the unsteady flight by gimbling its engines for the first 20 seconds. It kind of wobbled back and forth a little bit before flipping around and plummeting back to Earth. The flight ended with it crashing into the icy waters nearby in a fiery explosion. While this concluded the flight and the broadcast, it also began a stream of questions about what went wrong. We got some answers a few hours later when company leadership joined a call to discuss the accident. While they refused to provide any specifics about why the rocket lost control, it was revealed that the flight termination system was activated in response to the wobble, which shut down its nine Aquila engines and resulted in the quick return to the launch site. This was a bit strange as usually the flight termination system will detonate the entire stack together instead of just shutting down engines. Maybe there's a different protocol when the altitude of the rocket is so low. I don't think I've ever seen one just fall back down like that. So obviously it's a disappointing result for the company. However, they also stated that it has been considered a success in their books due to the valuable data they were able to collect. In addition to that, they also kept the launch pad intact, which means that they can immediately go back to testing.